19. And uh, I wanted to read a verse of scripture. You know, the, the assembly of the saints is a holy place, brethren. Okay. When, the, when the assembly of the saints gather together, that's a holy place, do you see? Because a God has drawing near the holy host of, of uh, heavenly observers, angelic beings, all, all our, our, our brethren who's gone ahead, they, they're drawing near when the saints assembly together. And let me read you, I found this in, verse, uh, in chapter 89, verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be, and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. So I thought, you know, that's a, that's a wonderful thought, you know, and I found that little nugget here in, in the chapter we're going to be studying. He who is taught by the Holy Spirit to be clear upon the covenant of grace will be a teacher well instructed in the things of the kingdom. However, he whose doctrine is a mixture of philosophy and, and common sense is scarcely fit to be the teacher of the people of God. Now, this psalm here is an example, okay, of a, of a brother who is, who is fit to be a teacher of the things of God. All right. It's a, this is an outstanding psalm, and it's really a rehearsal. As it begins, it's really a rehearsal of the faithfulness of God. Because this, this uh, psalm is he's calling on the mercy and the faithfulness of God. Faithfulness to his own covenant. Faithfulness to God's own covenant. Listen to verse 2, 3, and 4. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall... Thou establish in the very heavens, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant. And what was it that the God of heaven swore? Brethren, question. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. The psalmist is speaking to God's faithfulness to do that which he has proclaimed to do. He knows God will do it. And you know, within these proclamations, Beginning there in the very first verse, we are led in some, some very good considerations, some edifying considerations of what God has said. God said, I have made a covenant with my chosen, and his seed will I establish forever, and I throne to all generations. Now, establish forever, <laughs> this is a long time. He's speaking of an eternal heritage and an eternal throne and a one who reigns and judges forever now right off the bat uh, this language in this psalm has already left the confines of this earth and while it's true this text does have a lot to do with David it centers and it's using David as a springboard and a platform by which to address these things uh, we know that uh, David can only take them but so far and he's going to have to have some help. He's going to have to have some help here. For a priest and a king who lives forever, we know David wasn't a priest. And to reign forever, well, that's way beyond David's capabilities. We know we couldn't do that either. So our text, um, verse 19, it sits in this psalm like a, a, a precious stone would sit in a, in a setting, uh, a ring or something like that. Uh, if you look at it this way, the psalm is the setting for our text, okay? And the text is a gem in this setting. A literary scholar, he might disagree with me because, you know, they're trained to look for other things, quality of style and form. But, you know, we know that Jesus Christ is what the record is all about. It is a testimony of our Lord that brings salvation to men and reconciliation to God and, pre and peace to the seen and unseen realm. Now, let me just read the text for you. Then thou spakest in a vision to the Holy One and says, I have laid help upon one that is mighty, and I have exalted one chosen out of the people, from out of the people. I have found David my servant. I, uh, with my holy oil I have anointed him. I have exalted one chosen out of the people, and I have laid help on one that is mighty. Now, when we say Chosen, we're talking about choosing and we're talking about selection that's done by God. Amen. And when and I say that choosing and election of God, it's not an arbitrary thing. It's not of chance, it's not haphazard. See, God is seeing this thing all the way from the beginning through the end because He He did the choosing. That's what I mean by that. And brother, I know you agree with all of these things. Now, it's for sure that um, 
that the hand of God was on his servant David. As one chosen from out of the people, we can see this from the very outset. David was chosen from God. Uh, and you know, it, uh, it, we already alluded to this. Brother Boyce also alluded to this also. But uh, knowing God as we do, we could safely say that, uh, that David was in uh, this, this all. God had decided upon this, and this was a done thing before David was in the womb. Because we know that's the way God does things. God called for David. I have chosen thee. See that he he may he give that he give that uh, commandment from the very get go. See in the mind of God, I have chosen thee. We know that according to Samuel, First uh, Samuel six seven sixteen seven, the Lord doesn't look at men the way men look at one another, and His choosing and His election is based on something completely foreign to men the way they think. God told Samuel, "Look not at his countenance nor his statue, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth." For this reason, for this reason alone, the blessing was on David, and he found favor with God and man. Now, favor with man. He found favor with man to such an extent that David had the approval of all the people of Israel and in the sight of Saul's servants. Concerning this very thing, we have scripture. This is kind of scripture. So that Saul set David over the men of war. When it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out. Remember, the women came out from all of the cities of Israel, singing and dancing with, uh, to meet King Saul with temperance and, and joy, with instruments of music. And the, the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. So, you know, God was with David. We see there, God said, I have made a covenant with my chosen. David was chosen indeed. From his birth, his election, and exaltation. Now we've got to establish uh, this type. And, uh, and David is one of the types of the many types that God used to, to, to uh, set the stage for God. You know, actually, uh, if you want to know the truth about David and, uh, and his blessings, they were actually an overflow of the blessings of Christ. Actually, the, 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 the abundance of Christ's blessings overflowed back on David. Because David was a type. That's just the way it was on this. God chooses. Now, I'll tell you something. Right off the bat, you know, this just, it didn't have to say it this way, but it did. I have chosen. And what a battleground this has been, brethren. That God has made this declaration so many times, I have chosen. Uh, God chooses. You know, uh, I've got to say a few words about this. Uh, instead of rejoicing over the fact that God makes the decisions, men want to haggle. And they want to argue about what this means. Well, it's very simple what this means. It means that God selects and he picks out and he ordains. It's, it's not that hard. Men in this world, they do the same thing. What man turns an important project over to those who are just incapable of doing the job? You see? What do you think about all the fussing, though, and the fighting? That promotes to do just kind of the vision among God's people, whether God does the choosing or whether he allows men to choose. What do you think about a thing like that? Oh, you hear all kind of variations of this thing. It's a complaint is what it is. It's a complaint. That when you boil it all down, it's a complaint to, directed toward God. It basically goes like this. If God does the choosing by giving men to believe, and granted repentance, and yet he calls on every man to repent and believe, and, and those who do not are condemned, uh, men want to grumble. They say, this is a contradiction. This can't be the way it is, you see. Uh, but, you're, but clearly, this is the case, isn't it? Exactly the case. We have it right there in the scriptures. Men, men can judge themselves unworthy of eternal life. And then it can also say, others have been ordained to eternal life. Right there in Acts 13, 48. You're familiar with the account. And that since these two things are true, and they are, uh, still men will not receive this. The understanding, you see, the understanding of God doesn't come from our ability to reason these things out. Understanding of God comes from God. God's got to give it to you. God's got to give it to us. Despite these things, though, men still come up with uh, their, their own answers to these things. They teach that God lets men do the deciding. They teach it's up to men. It's up to men to respond uh, to God's Christ. And, and, uh, and they ignore. They, it don't fit. So they ignore and they disregard 
uh, God's purpose in choosing. I have, Christ said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of this world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Yes, men are commanded to believe. Nevertheless, faith and believing is a gift of God, isn't it? And, you know, when you think about it, everything we get from God is a gift. Salvation, faith, and all these things are a gift of God, and we're commanded to keep them and hold on to them. Now, and this faith, what about this faith that we, God gives us? What about faith? It's able to receive these things, brethren. It has no problem what God, what God declares. Once we come into the kingdom of God, then we leave all these other hang-ups behind. We leave them in the world. Faith has no problem that it is God who directs the steps of men and who can turn a king's heart whichsoever way he pleases. And, you know, none of this conflicts with what Joshua said. Choose this day whom you will serve. And it doesn't conflict at all with what our Lord said. Remember when he stood up in the last day? And he, that last day of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Now, one final word, and I'm, I'm gone from this. I'm going to tell you this morning that this kind of confusion that we had today over this, it only happens when, those, when these kind of folks spend too much time in the books of other men instead of the book of God. Amen. Okay, It's not scholarly to disagree with what God says. It's unbelief. And it's accounts, it accounts, seriously, it accounts for all the division we have in our modern religious world because men who have trouble with what God has said, they think too much. They think too much of what men say. I believe that. Uh, so, so now, uh, if we're having trouble, you know, with the scriptures in some regard with what God has said, I say let's pray for understanding in these matters. And so let's not be so quick to go to other men. In this text, it clearly states that God chooses, and he exalts those who he chooses, brethren. At the time, your exaltation may not be so evident, but the people of God, they have been exalted. You got to be in an exalted state to be partakers of the benefit. We've been made to sit in heavenly places and to walk on the highway of holiness. Now, I want to move on to the main one. The main thought in this text, for as you know, it's the intention of the Spirit of God to bring man's attention to the covenant of God, the covenant that God has made with himself. You know, men are only mentioned uh, as they relate to that covenant of purpose. I will, and God throughout the record repeats this, I will establish my covenant with you, saith the Lord. And this goes over, it's, it's a resounding theme throughout the scriptures. Now, Isaiah 42, 1 says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now, brethren, you know it's got to be good. And you know it's got to be right because God has elected it. He has established it, and he has exalted it. God has done it. And this is the kind of thing that we love. No, we love it. We never grow tired of it. It's, I, we never grow tired of the wondrous salvation, hearing about it, that comes from God. And the manner of this, of this salvation and, 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 and the intensity of, it, of its marvel. And as the purpose of God unfolds in this world, we understand, the saints understand, that what God made, everything God made and created, had his purpose in mind. That just sounds like a simple yeah. thing. And it was for his, for it was his purpose that all things were created. Amen. And within the work of creation, the promise of God, and, and the promises of God, the promise of God, and the coming of Jesus Christ, it was woven, you see, in the fabric of life. Yeah. And every detail and facet is woven in there. Uh, it was hardwired, if you want to look at this, in every connection. Jesus, uh, God has, uh, has made this connection. Every connection that man will make to this world, there's something that's going to be something pointed to Jesus Christ. On the final day, mark my words, it will, be, it will be seen then how the world, the world passed by every connection God made. One connection after the other. 
associations in this life that God made pointing to Christ Jesus. Now, in preparing for God's uh, Christ and for this work he was to do, I, I thought about this. God was like a, 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 a meticulous engineer in this regard. Uh, he didn't miss a thing. He really didn't, brother. Uh, at every contact point and at every junction and every point of life, God put a relay there, so to speak, and he put a contact there, a connection back to Jesus. Now, when we come into the kingdom, we see these things as types and shadows, don't we? But, but they were intended to be uh, pointing to Jesus. This is an elaborate work of weaving and merging his purpose in Jesus Christ. All of these things now, brother, was decided upon before he created all things, and he put them into place beforehand so that we would realize it was done in, in the anticipation of the time. It was done in the anticipation of the fullness of time when Jesus would come and he would make that final connection that all the things that God had done would come to life. Because Jesus would complete them, see? He would come in and he would be that link to heaven and that link to earth and all his connections would fall into place. He stood in the absence of man's inability as one who was sent from God. He would bring the purpose of God to life. And this is the subject at hand this morning, isn't it? He has, he has everything to do. Jesus has everything to do that he's been chosen and exalted. Psalm 89, we have David here in this psalm. He's a reference point for the psalmist. We've already made that point. He's a, it's a reminder to himself and a plea to God of his faithfulness to raise up a man for the sure mercies of David. Men are in the employment of God, certainly Specifically in his ongoing purpose. Yes. In this way, David is used to introduce Jesus Christ. That's how it accounts for the fact that uh, 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 David was so, so much like uh, Jesus. And, and, and we're able to see the types in this. David's life, it contributes to the coming of Jesus Christ. Because Christ will come through his line, you see. That's the reason David was even in the scriptures. That's the accounts... That's why uh, this accounts for the fact that David was a mighty warrior, a mighty warrior, that he was a ruler of God's people, that he was a man after God's own heart, that he was a shepherd, that he would slay Goliath and cut off the man's head who held the people of God in captivity. You see, the association, Ezekiel had this word, and I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Now, you can see what this is leading, trying to lead up to. Now, in view of that word, let us, let us review the account. I want to go back, and I, I thought that I would review the account of David and Nathan that evening in uh, 2 Samuel 7. You know, you remember the account. That's when uh, uh, David tells Nathan he wanted to build God a house, and it came to pass that David had rest from all his enemies. Now he had to time to think. He told Nathan the prophet, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the tabernacle of the Lord, it, uh, it's behind curtains. Nathan replied, go, do all that is thine in thine heart, for God is with thee. Later that evening, you remember the account, God comes to Nathan, and he, and he says this is a response to David's desire. David, you see, he had a thought, he had a thought to build the Lord a house, but God said, I'll build you a house. And you know that word that came through Nathan, it came the promise of a son, Solomon. He shall build a house, you remember. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish this throne forever. Now, chastening of the son, that's in there too, you remember. But withdrawal of the covenant, a promise, is impossible. He, it, uh, he makes that point. In thine house. And thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Now Jesus himself would make this reference. He would say, he would declare among men, a greater than Solomon is here. Now we speak of reigning in a throne. We're talking about being exalted and lifted up. It's being called up higher. It's when we're, that's what we're talking about. So God makes it known to David that he's the one. God said, I'm the one. 
Up to this point, I'm the one who has brought about everything needed for my purpose of salvation. I appreciate it anyway, but God reminded David, it's been me who's been taking care of the people, providing, uh, 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 removing the enemy, and providing for safety and a land of dwelling. And I took thee from the sheep coat, from following after the sheep. I took thee to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. So I'll build a house. So then the exaltation of David is about a, a greater exaltation to come. Two things in our text, and they'll carry us to our conclusion. I want to tell you right now that this phrase, I have laid help upon, means that God provided what was needed. It's the same word as help meet as seen in Genesis, after Adam named all the animals, he, arrived, he realized after they got through proceeding, he realized, says, I don't have a helpmate, you see. It's the same word here. And in Genesis, we, we, we see that God provided Adam a helpmate. And this is the same idea that's carried in this verse. The arrangement for salvation, brethren, brethren required a helpmate, a helper. Actually, the nature of salvation is... All who are enlisted are enlisted to fight. God has calculated salvation to enlist all who come as helpers of God. That's a blessing. There's not just a, a select few who are, who are enlisted to fight, but all who come to God are required to pick it up for God. And brother, we don't shrink back and leave it to others to do. I have laid help. Upon one that is mighty, that God has laid help on a mighty one. And the mighty tells us what kind of help meet it does. It tells us about the quality, quality of the one. Mighty is the word. The coming one is, in God's name would be mighty. This is the mighty in Isaiah 9, 6, isn't it? His name shall be mighty God. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, that is glorious and in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And the question is asked in Psalms 24, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. I've laid help on one that is mighty. Jesus, not one of many valiant and mighty men. He's the only one. <laughs> It's the only one. For it is written, I have trodden the wide press alone. For of the people there was none. Yes. Jesus strong and mighty. Mighty in battle. Now I want to know. I want to ask you, brethren. Now this Jesus, this mighty Jesus. Is this the Jesus you're following today? Huh? Is this the one? Is this the Jesus you've received? This mighty Jesus. I mean, do you have an awareness about this Jesus? As he's mighty one who is mighty in battle, who has no problems with difficulties. Is, does this Jesus have your attention today, brethren? Jesus, he doesn't have any problems with the wickedness of men, the rebellion of mankind that was orchestrated by Satan. Is it giving the Lord of glory a hard time? Certainly not. Jesus has put an end to rebellion. He has put an end to sin and death. And if you've come to him, well, he's done this in you, brethren. Yes. Now, when I read that part of the text that says, laid help on one that is mighty, I sort of saw this as the Son of God, the Son of God view. That's, I, I saw it as, as I was, that was the, the Son of God perspective. That, uh, the, uh, I mean, that's, that's what made him mighty, isn't it? That he was, his father was not Adam. His father was uh, God, God the Father. He was the only begotten son. The things that were to be done were mighty things. He was to do mighty things. And uh, by the way, which the least of them was defeating Satan. That was, that was the least of the mighty things. Because we just already mentioned, but why in the end an angel will snatch up Satan by the nap of the neck and throw him in the lake of fire. So the mighty work really wasn't defeating Satan. We were always led to believe that, weren't we? Brethren, the mighty work is when, is when Jesus provided that final link in the completion to the purpose of God. When by his own sinless life, you see, 
that he lived out. He would bring power to God's purpose. Amen. And he would usher in a full and complete salvation, nothing lacking. That's why the scripture can say we're complete in him. Amen. He forever destroyed the power of sin. Oh, we need to preach that. Get it through people's heads. And he utterly destroyed Satan. He cleansed the heavens. Praise God. He reconciled the world to God. He made just men perfect. He put the Holy Spirit to work. Amen. Convicting men of righteousness, sin, and judgment to come. That's not the half of it either. Mighty one to save. Amen. Strong and mighty. Jesus' power comes from the fact that he's not vulnerable to Satan. He's perfectly it's righteous and spotless, unconditionally spotless, as we've said, and blameless. And this is the record. We've got it in the record. And in him was found no sin. John said, we heard him with our own ears. We saw him with our own eyes. We've touched him and handled him with our own hands. And we bear this witness to you. In him is no darkness. No darkness. And his blood cleanses us from all sin. When Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness tonight, I don't know if Satan knew this, but he was barking up the wrong tree, brethren. Yes, he was. After that encounter, it was just a matter of time when Jesus would finish Satan, control over men. Now, there was nothing Satan could really do about it. David was mighty in battle on the earth. Jesus is mighty in battle. Exalted king of glory. I like that picture. That's what's presented to us in the scriptures and it's brought up, been brought up to us recently in our, in our media. So that picture given to us on the Mount of Transfiguration when the Peter, James, and John accompanied Jesus. When Jesus was joined by Elijah and Moses and the, face of, and the face of Jesus shone brilliant like the sun and his clothes were white as light itself. And God speaks out of a bright cloud over and over them. And whom I am when he says, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Yes. Now on the Mount of Transfiguration, I would say this is a, no, another son of God view. Uh, when, when who Jesus really was yes. on the inside, it burst through that shell of his yes. physical body. And the three disciples, they give us testimony. They were completely overwhelmed at this. Outside the miracles of Jesus, the Jesus miracles he wrought, and then outside the incredible things he spoke, Jesus looked like other men. He had to eat. He had got tired. He, got, he had to sleep. And Jesus had blood running through his veins. We know he bled when he was cut. Jesus had a body like all of us. His mother was Mary human mother God said I have exalted one chosen from out of the people from out of the people I've chosen one he gives us this type of David I chose David from out of the people I chose him and I'm and, he, and this is a, to lead us to the fact that out of the people God's going to choose his choosing will be done from out of the people now we come to that verse where uh, I wanted to go this way with it. That you know Jesus, he picks up a title, and we've already made reference to it, Brother Gene and several others, that Jesus on purpose, he picks up the title Son of Man. <coughs> Son of Man. It's like that time when they laid the, the man with palsy at the feet of Jesus, and he, when he saw the faith of them, he said, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins are forgiven thee. He read the minds of the religious leaders in the crowd. They said, he blasphemed. Jesus said, why do you have this wickedness in your hearts? Is it easier to forgive sins or to say to this man, arise and walk? Just to show you that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sins. He spoke to the man and told him to arise, pick your bed and go home. So Jesus he picks up this Son of Man and he associates it, associates it with the power of God. The power of God working in a man because, you know, the crowd marveled and were amazed that the power of God had been given to a man. And so for this reason, Jesus picks up the title. In the gospel account alone, a hundred times, Jesus refers to himself as a Son of Man. Chosen out of the people, the Son of Man view. The mighty Son of Man, chosen by God. Only God could find and choose one who was qualified to do what was needed to be done, both in heaven 
and in earth because a work had to be done would qualify in both places. One who is qualified for heaven. He is God's Christ. We needed him. We needed him to be a man. He is our Christ. Amen. I like what Brother Leon said last night. I tell you, I said that was good. I'm going to write that down. God's perfect man. Our perfect God. Amen. Amen. Our text, I have exalted one chosen from among the people. It has the same ring to it as we find in this verse here in the 80, Psalm. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. This isn't a direct reference to our text. There is a distinction between the, uh, between the title the Son of Man and God. There's a relationship, a special relationship there. For God created the distinction. God himself made this relationship because he developed this thought. We think of Jesus calling himself uh, the Son of Man. We think immediately to that verse in Daniel. We've referenced that also there in, where it's in the night visions. And behold, there came with the clouds of heaven one likened unto the Son of Man. And he came even into the Ancient of Days. You see, so well, our, our thinking a lot of the times is that Jesus referenced back to this particular verse. And he lifted it up and it applied it to himself and, uh, and, and fulfilled it. And Jesus, in this way, now he's staking a claim, is what he's doing. He's staking a claim to this, that is, that in fact, in fact, I'm that son of man, you see. And yet, even in Jesus' day, the bystanders would say, who is this son of man? Same question's being asked today. Now, even if the connection of Jesus with the son of man is even made today, it's not made with this, with this uh, insight of the vision of Daniel. Rarely is it made. Uh, for men think of Jesus as a son of man. They, they think of only in terms of how it connects them uh, back to their uh, practical uh, life here on the earth or it connects them back to this earth. It, 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 it goes the wrong way. We want our connections to take us up this way Amen. and not back this way. Uh, they would think of verses maybe like, uh, the fo I thought of this one, this a lot. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head, which is true. But see, now there's, there's, there's better text than that. We can do better than that. They, they, we want to make the association that the Son of Man is returning in these same clouds of glory. You see, that's the, that's just, this term Son of Man is a designation that God made himself, and we see it mostly in Ezekiel. It refers to a particular work that God is doing and when he's doing it in a man. It refers to it as a son of man. And it was God's intention that this connection be made and, and so that we could see that it was God was working exclusively through this man, Ezekiel. And so then we suspect that God is working through, exclusively through this man, Christ Jesus. And this is an association that Christ is laying claim to, you see, that the Father... The Father, he is working through the Son of Man. And this is by whom, through whom, he will reveal himself. So all these connections have been made. Now I'm going to say that the Son of Man, I'm going to agree with others who said this already, that in order to, in order to become the Son of Man, the Son of God, in order for, the, for him to become the Son of Man, he had to step down. He had to put away his... Uh, his divine entitlements and his privileges, he had to sheathe them and lay them aside. He had to take on the form of human flesh and for the one who knew no sin, he, he became sin. He had to, he became sin. He had to immerse himself in this world of wickedness. He had to go into battle against sin and then Jesus had to live out the types for the Lord, he is our David. And for God had taken him from this, he, God's going to take him from this low position. And he's going to highly exalt him. And just as David was exalted from a lowly place, so that God has taken this great shepherd. And he has highly exalted him. The Son of Man will be highly exalted. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but can be touched. Because he was in all points tempted like we are. Yet without sin. Now the part to emphasize in this verse, of course, is yet without sin. Jesus knows what it's like to be hungry and tired, ignored, disregarded. He knows what it's like to be lied to, lied about. 
He knows uh, disappointment and heartache. He knows how it feels to be pushed around, shoved around, slapped on, spit on. He knows pain and anguish and heartache. He knows how to shed tears. He knows death. And all these things, brethren, and more. Jesus can relate to our experiences, but then see, that's where it stops. That's where all the... So he, and also, he knows what it's like to be tempted at all points like we are. But that's, and that's where all the, the association stops. Because Jesus did no sin. That's where now he can be effective for men. That's where he could be effective, you see, by being able to relate to all these things. And then the fact that he did no sin, that he can continue to be a, an effective high priest. It's a, uh, a subtle, subtle thing that it meant a lot to me to see this. He continues to be effective. Golly, God has highly exalted him because of this. Jesus cannot be any more exalted than he is at this time. For all things have been placed under his feet. Nothing has been left. See, nothing has been left that is not subject to him. He is exalted. God has exalted the man Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, that means that God has an exalted purpose, doesn't it? Yeah. It gives him an exalted people. You've heard of the Midas touch. That everything he touched turned to gold, haven't you? Well, Jesus has the exalted touch. Everything our Lord is exalted. It becomes an exalted thing. Jesus has truly gone where no man has gone before. This can be said only about the man, Christ Jesus. Because, you know, he, sent, he descended. To the very, very lowest depths you could descend to a point where he be actually became sin. And, and to that depth he descended to those heights. He's ascended to the very highest point, to the highest pinnacle of power exalted in this exalted Christ. Brother, we've been cleansed, washed in his own blood, no less. Yes, we have. Amen. We've been put in a kingdom of God's dear son quickened together with Christ raised up together with him made to sit in the heavenly places in Christ so I thought to myself then so if someone is looking for clarification into these things such things that make up salvation the purpose of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ should men should the saints be looking anywhere else but upward to this one whom God has exalted and chosen out of the people? Thank you, brother.